settle in with us for the hour as our panelists explore the past, present, and future of Juneteenth and how to celebrate, honor, and recognize the holiday in your organizations and in your everyday lives. So now let's get to our speakers. Our first guest is an esteemed professor who lectures at one of the most recognizable historically Black universities in the country and has been doing so since 1989. She teaches courses that introduce students to the social, political, economic, cultural, and historical experiences of African Americans, has published and presented various papers on subjects in the African diaspora, and is currently working on a book about the voluntary associations established by African American women groups through history. We are very excited to welcome an Associate Professor of African American Studies at Howard University, Dr. Lila Ammons. Welcome, Dr. Ammons. Thank you for that nice introduction. <laughs> Happy to introduce you. Our next guest for today is an award-winning professional speaker and author of several books that leverage neuroscience to drive behavior change and improve organizational culture. He has over 25 years of ex expertise in working with global companies, including many of the Fortune 100. In 2020, he was awarded the prestigious Certified Speaking Professional or CSP designation from the National Speakers Association and now he's at NLI facilitating many of our solutions on DEI and culture to some of our top clients. I want to welcome one of our senior client strategists, the one and only John Edwards. Thank you for joining us, John. My pleasure. I look forward to the conversation. Some of you may be familiar with this next name as he was the former vice president of research practices and consulting here at NLI. He spent over 14 years in senior roles at Apple and currently he's transitioned into the tech space at one of the world's largest cybersecurity and cloud service companies, leading some of their DEI efforts. And not to mention, he's a huge Marvel junkie. We're so happy to welcome the Vice President of Inclusion, Diversity, and Engagement at Akamai, Khalil Smith. Welcome back to the party, Khalil. Thank you. It's a party. I am super excited to be here. <laughs> and last but not least, our final panelist for today is a speaker you bring in when you want everyone's jaws to drop by the end of the speech. In her current position, she delivers briefings and keynote presentations, facilitates workshops, and helps to develop our solutions for our client organizations. Just this year, Reagan Communications named her one of the top women in communications and a diversity and inclusion champion. And in her career, she broke barriers as one of the black female, as one of the only black female C-level speechwriters in the Fortune 100. You can, uh, she challenges businesses to get serious about inclusion in her TED talk that has over 2 million views. Not only do you get to hear from her today, we are very lucky to have her at NLI as a senior client strategist, Janet Stovall. Janet, so great to have you. And it is so great to be here with you and with this amazing panel. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. And so now that I've introduced you to our rock star panel, I wanna give you some context around who we are and what we do at the Neuroleadership Institute. We were founded over two decades ago and have grown into such a powerhouse, publishing re re relevant research, partnering with over half of the Fortune 100 and many of the Fortune 500, putting our science to work all across the globe. And in Eli's existence, we found that there's a gap between the science and what organizations actually do. So we're working to close that gap with culture and leadership transformation, performance management strategies, and our diversity, equity, and inclusion work. We have not lots of notable published journal articles and research-based papers on our practice areas, and one particular model, the SEEDS model stands out today that I'll share a bit more later. But by no surprise, you know why we're here today for a special episode of Your Brain at Work to talk about Juneteenth, the newly passed federal holiday in Congress as of yesterday. But the question is why? Well, in 2020, NLI and many other organizations in the country officially recognized Juneteenth as a paid holiday, which is why for some of our regulars, you'll notice that we moved today's session to a Thursday because the Neuroleadership Institute employees are off tomorrow in observance of the holiday. I'm also very curious um, to hear about some of your companies. So if you're off for Juneteenth um, or if there's any programming around the holidays, please let us know in the chat because we would love to talk about that a little bit later in the session. But we're here today because it's an important time to recognize this holiday. One that you may have heard about in passing, you were lucky to learn about in school, or you may not have been exposed to until your adult life, most likely in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. Um, no matter where you learn this knowledge, we're happy to have you here for this discussion. But I want to, as we anchor on science, dive into the session and bring you back to that seeds model. And one of the things that we like to say at NLI is if you have a brain, you have bias. And so with that model, we narrow down some of the types of bias into five main categories, similarity, expedience, experience, distance, and safety. Because when we identify the types of biases we have, we can help to mitigate those. But I wanna hone in specifically on experience bias. 
we can go our whole lives without knowing about something so substantial. And in the context specifically around Juneteenth, something that has meaning and importance to a large group of people. And because we have such varying knowledge or experience with that history, the dark history of the United States, we need to create more intentional platforms for shared knowledge and opportunities to deepen our understanding of one another. So that is what today is about. Examining Juneteenth is our collective history, ch chatting with our panel about what drives them today, and providing everyone with some opportunities for, uh, to look towards the future. So now I am going to turn the reins over to Dr. Ammons, who I believe may, is she here? Yes, I'm here. I yeah, can't... she's here. Oh, she can't turn her video on. I think we need to promote her to our co-host so we can get her back on. Right. Yep. All right. There we go. And now I can give oh. her some control so she can take over the reins and give us some historical perspective and anchor us on some of that, uh, that history. Oh, thank you so much. Nice introduction. Today, I want to talk about the evolution of Juneteenth as a holiday. Uh, it is a holiday that's been celebrated for over 155 years, and it's not well known. Uh, two, I want to talk about the tradition of African Americans, uh, tradition of Juneteenth as a holiday. I also want to talk about Juneteenth as a day of resilience, as well as it is a zipper of persistence and never giving up. And lastly, I want to talk about why Juneteenth is relevant in 2021. The story of African Americans start with the 20 Africans that arrived uh, in Virginia in 1619. They were bought or sold to into servitude. By uh, 1705, the Virginia Assembly had declared all Negroes, mulattoes, and Native Americans as property. So by the early by 1750, slavery was legalized in all of the 13 colonies, not only Virginia. The, uh, the Civil War started in 1861 when a military group of states, 13 states to call themselves the Confederacy attacked a federal garrison at Fort Sumner in South Carolina. Now during this war, over 185,000 African-American soldiers joined the Union troops and about 38,000 lost their lives. Shortly, uh, two years after the, the Civil War started, the Emancipation Proclamation, um, on January 1st, 1863, President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, but it did not free all slaves. It only freed slaves in the rebel states and not the law states. Now, some of the Confederate, some of the slave owners of Confederate states did not think that they had to abide by Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. Indeed, the word got out that the Union troops soldiers were in Mississippi and Louisiana. And as soon as that word, uh, they began to hear it, the enslavers <clears throat> began to fled with their slaves to the Southwest, to an area where Union troops were not present and where they had heard that Texas was slave haven. And, but you see that in 1861, African-Americans had got the word in South Carolina, so they were celebrating and we see a picture of that. It's also important to note that the Union troops, the colored troops also were very instrumental in helping to spread the word to African-Americans that they were free. On, this day, June 19th, 1865, the day that enslaved African-Americans in Texas formally was informed and told that they were free by General Granger. But freedom did not mean a equate to social and political economic freedom. Indeed, <clears throat> um, 
the executive order. And here is um, the text of that executive order. I'm not going to read this executive order, but I do want to draw your attention to the last paragraph. And I will read, read this comment. Uh, the freemen are advised, and I quote, to remain quietly in their present homes and work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and they will not be supported in idleness either there or elsewhere. If you get the full intent of this, you see that African-Americans were pretty much left on their own. They were going to have to make, make a way for themselves. Now, <clears throat> to recognize this day as a day of liberation, African-Americans celebrated Juneteenth for organizing such festivities as parades, barbecues, dances, games, prayers, stories, and they pay tribute to honor the colored troops that were instrumental also in helping to spread the word. Food became a central feature of the Juneteenth holiday and participants would bring their favorite dish, which often included items not eaten on a daily basis, uh, such as lamb and pork and desserts. Now, red foods such as watermelon, strawberry soda pop, and red velvet cake were feature items to symbolize the blood their ancestors spilled to achieve freedom. Now, tea cakes were some of the desserts used by enslaved uh, person as a special treat. Uh, and this is according to the director of the Juneteenth Tea Commission do yourself a favor and take this recipe and find out what a great treat it is. Indeed, when I was a little girl, my mother used to make them for me. So I do know that if you uh, have a uh, chance to use this recipe, you might even feel free after you eat them. There are also, it's important to note that there were laws that um, African-Americans were not to dress up. And at these celebrations, uh, African-American normally wore their finest of clothes uh, and we see them uh, celebrating here. Uh, we also see that in Washington, DC in 1866, they also uh, had gotten the word and they were celebrating uh, Juneteenth. It's important to note that the period following the Civil War was called Reconstruction. It's clear that African-Americans had made modest gains, political gains. Some were elected to Congress and some to the House of Representatives and African men had the right to vote. Uh, so progress has been made, not only African-American making progress, but everyone was making progress. Now, out of the fear that blacks would take their jobs, whites began to rewrite the history of, of the Civil War and white supremacy triumphed. They produced false narratives, fake news uh, to suggest that African-Americans were unable to govern and that reconstruction had been a failure. The daughters of the American Revolutionary War sought to make sure that their children learned the version, their version of history. They helped to sponsor monuments uh, to celebrate Confederate leaders and promote them as the real hero of American history. And this, all of this led to Jim Crowism, segregation, anti-Black violence, and a rewritten history of the Civil War. African-Americans found themselves completely without any political rights by the 1900s. So there were ebbs and flows in the celebration. Uh, by the 1900s, Juneteenth participation began to decline due to the Great Depression, and many African Americans went to urban areas in search of job opportunities. Employers were not very sympathetic to um, recently arrived immigrants and did not give um, time off for this celebration. If the holiday did not fall on weekends, few participated. Classrooms and textbooks de-emphasize experience of African-Americans as an uh, enslaved person and emphasize emancipation, 
proclamation's date, January 1st, 1863, as the date of freedom, and did not mention Juneteenth. In the eight, 1950s and 60s, there was a rekindling of interest due to the civil rights movement when students uh, that, were, that, that were protesters and um, demonstrators began to wear buttons to show that they linked their struggle for racial equality and voting rights to that of their ancestors who had struggled for freedom. Another incident was the Poor People Campaign in Washington, D.C. Uh, that March in 1968, the participants um, that participated in that march, they returned home and began to organize Juneteenth. And this helped to repopularize and it began to spread into areas it had not been before. Um, <clears throat> in 1980, with the help of Al Edwards, Texas became the first state to honor Juneteenth. This young man here provides us with one of the reasons why folks fought so hard, so very hard to make this day a holiday so youth could learn their history. Philadelphia is a very important place because it is the place where the first constitution in this country was written. Now, Juneteenth is about persistence and being successful against high odds. Juneteenth serves as a reminder of America past and serve as an inspiration for all Americans to see what's possible with resilience and hope for a brighter future. Juneteenth is an opportunity for everybody to do the right thing. We all have seen evidence of people trying to rewrite history. It's time for us to educate ourselves. You should educate yourself, learn about the different cultures. Now, African-Americans did not wait for somebody to help us. We provide an opportunity for ourselves by using activism and protests in order to take control of our narrative, to make America stay truth and to press it to keep the promise of equality. Juneteenth, I'm so happy that the Congress has decided to make it, hopefully President Biden will sign it, as Sade mentioned in the very beginning, to make it a national holiday. And with that, uh, thank you for listening. If, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Ammons. Um, I am going to uh, take back the control because it sounds like we can't see you. And yeah, so everyone I, I, wants to be able to see you so we can turn that I, I, back. I, I, there I, we wanted go. Be, I, I wanted to be seen, but I kept turning it on, but it wouldn't <laughs> let me, because you had control, it wouldn't let me, it wouldn't. It wouldn't it's uh, all good. So we had a request. And so I wanted to make sure that now they get to see that lovely face of yours. So now everyone gets to see her. And I so now you. as we move <laughs> and transition into this next session, which we'll kind of, you know, discuss a little bit more of um, our panel discussion. And I, I wanna make sure that everyone is aware that um, we dropped that in the chat, the tea cake recipe. Um, Dr. Ammons wanted to be adamant about making sure that everyone got that and learned that and made some. So I am making sure that I'm making some tea cakes this weekend. So <laughs> um, as we transition to the next portion is this Q and A with our panel. And for those of you who may be watching and have questions, please feel free to drop those in the chat and we'll try to get to them. But um, I do wanna invite our panel to come off mute and kind of answer some of these. And we have some questions we've prepared to ask, but again, please feel free to, um, to bring those out. But I wanna to get to our first one. Um, so for many people, um, right, Juneteenth became a recognized holiday after the murder of George Floyd. And I kind of wanna ask our panel how you feel about how companies navigate the holiday today. I know I wanna to toss this to you specifically first, John, uh, because I know you have a lot of experience specifically with clients and working with them, um, not only in your career, but at NLI. I want to kind of touch on your opinions on this first about how you feel about how, you know, companies have navigated the holiday, even before, again, this national recognition as of this year. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. 
Uh, you know, it's no great surprise to anyone that there has just been a flurry of inquiries uh, from organizations wanting to figure out how do we have the right conversations in our work environment as a result of the social unrest and the horrors that we uh, were witnessing in the last 18 months, much less now uh, bringing in the conversation really around the history of what's been going on uh, you know, uh, across the United States uh, and, uh, and in my case, the Caribbean, since that's where I'm originally from. So organizations are really diving in. And, and you know, it is, let's just say, it's a sensitive conversation to have. Uh, and for many folks, this really, it, the recent experiences are really creating an awareness in them and a drive uh, to want to have the right kinds of conversations. And so a number of questions have emerged in businesses and corporations across the country. And number one is, what's the problem we need to solve for? How do we help our employees? And what's the role that a leader or an executive has uh, in, in, in nurturing and helping and creating an environment uh, right, where the, the right thing is being done and people are being treated in the right way. And that's one of the things that's so exciting for me about NLI and why I was so thrilled to, to become part of this team. So that NLI takes a scientific perspective on it. And what we've discovered is you introduce the SEEDS model before and we have a few other models as well. By taking a scientific perspective, we've been able to give organizations a language that they can use to have that conversation. Uh, and to start that particular process. And we're finding remarkably effective numbers. We're talking about numbers in the 70 percentile and 80 percentile of leaders who are coming back and saying, I am now mitigating bias on a regular reoccurring basis. So really remarkable results that have been seen from the terrific work that's been done. So that's a really step one that I see organizations are taking. And, and, and I sort of put it into this model, right? It's a recognition, education, understanding model. And so when we think about Juneteenth, the first thing is, what are we gonna to do to recognize it? And we're seeing in the chat box, a lot of organizations, now that this is a federal holiday, are saying, hey, I've got tomorrow off. There are other companies that are saying, I wanna give you flex holidays and you choose which ones you wanna take off. Uh, I think the bottom line is organizations are gonna to have to take a look at how they wanna uh, uh, deal with this particular day and recognize the growing importance that it has. And part of that recognition is that, you know what, uh, this is not just about Black American history, this is about American history. Uh, and, and the influence that uh, the history of Black Americans have had in, 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 the, in, the, in the full integration of American history. And so, uh, you know, really recognizing the significance of the, of, of the commonality there, I think, is important for organizations. So then you get to the education piece, and that is where we start talking about things like our ally program, one of our new programs we've just uh, rolled out around how you can become a better ally, not only in the workplace, but in social environments as well. Uh, and our flex program, which is how do you return to a hybrid work environment? And the reason that's important here is because we're seeing a lot of data about how African-Americans feel a deeper sense of belonging in a hybrid environment than they've ever felt in the regular work environment. So how do companies make that transition to a hybrid work environment without hurting that sense of belonging uh, that underrepresented groups are having. And then we get to the understanding part of my formula, which is really around recognizing the intersectionality uh, between Black American history uh, and other represented groups you know, in the organization as well. Um, and just recognizing how important that is to, 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 to see how that all comes together as one uh, versus you know, a, a conversation that just, to, that just keeps everything you know, really segregated. Because if we do that, we're just talking about Black American history, we're, we're alienating you know, uh, other individuals in the workforce, our Asian American friends, et cetera, uh, under other represented groups. And so there's, when you really study as, this terrific overview has given us, when you really study Black American history, you see a lot of intersectionality in how we've all influenced each other. Thank you for that, John. And I, I, I love the way specifically you're talking about how it's important to communicate and like make sure we have these avenues, right, for opening up that, that, that we're not excluding, right? That, and that's one of the things that Inline says, if you're not actively including, you're excluding, right? So that's really mm -hmm. important. And then Jan and I kind of want to toss to you because I know specifically your background in communications, I think someone mentioned this in the chat and we can drop this in too. Um, I want to stress your background in communications and how companies specifically can navigate How do you talk about this, right? How do you address this and do it right? How do you, <laughs> and I know that you have some thoughts specifically on this. There's a very, uh, a post you put out today um, that I, I would love to have you kind of address as well. Okay, well, sure. Um, that's right. My background is communications and it's in marketing a lot. And so you think about how companies deal with this. They generally do it on two fronts. 
they're talking internally to their employees and they're talking externally to the outside world. And most companies come to Juneteenth with the best of intentions. Of course they do. But good intentions without good insight can create some really negative implications. And insight starts with, doc, with education, as Dr. Evans said. By the same token, to paraphrase E. Franklin Frazier, who's the first Black sociologist, first Black president of the American Sociolo Sociological Society, said education can be too much inspiration and too little information. So if companies are going to step into this space, they should step into it with the same intention and insight that they would any other marketing or um, executive or employee communications type of work. So for example, if you think you're gonna create a graphic out there in the world that says celebrate Juneteenth, but you're not giving employees a day off, how exactly are they supposed to celebrate it? Or if you um, write a sentence that says July 19th, 1865 was when slavery ended. The truth is it didn't. It didn't end until December with the passing of the 13th Amendment. Um, and this one is one of the best ones I've seen lately. Like Dr. Ammon said, one of the traditions of Juneteenth is to have red food. I know personally of somebody who works for a company that put together these wonderful gift boxes and in it, there was popcorn watermelon flavored popcorn. Now, I don't need to say why that was probably a bad idea. I will ask the question, who did they ask about that? You know, so I think you have to, when you plan these things as a company, you need to find the people who are affected and ask some questions, just go ask some black people. Um, and in this company's defense, they chose a supplier that was a black owned company. But I will say once again, maybe they should have thought that through a little bit. So a little education, you gotta understand what it is you're trying to do here. If you're gonna commemorate it, you need to understand it. And um, the bottom line is Juneteenth can be an amazing thing for amplifying Black American voices, as John said, for putting Black history in the context of American history, it can do all those things. The trick is to be transformative and not to be performative. And that's going to require paying attention to what you're doing, doing it with intention, and knowing exactly what it is that you're trying to you know, accomplish with celebrating this holiday. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Ammons, I don't know if you maybe have something to add to that or... Maybe, I don't know, especially in the education space. I would just add that you're absolutely right. I think you have to understand the intent of the holiday. One of the things that I, I did not mention is that this holiday, like people thought that everybody was just basically just having a party and having a good time. But the little unknown secret is that it was an opportunity for the Black elected officials to come and recruit to get people to support them and to talk about um, how they could uh, in, indeed gain political power. So as cooperation attempt to, uh, uh, corporations attempt to uh, take advantage of Juneteenth holiday, I think it's very important as Janet has indicated that they are fully aware of what the real intent that people had and take the opportunity to try to come up with ways to bring us together as opposed for us to, um, be separate and then indeed this is an opportunity as I've already mentioned for us to actually educate ourselves, learn other people's culture because that's what history is all about. History is about having us to learn what our ancestors had done and how they interact with other folks so that we can indeed create a better uh, uh, future. So I just say to companies to take this opportunity to learn about others that we're all humans and to try indeed to uh, uh, make the pie larger as opposed to smaller. That's what I would say. <laughs> Didn't mean to go on and on. You're good. <laughs> and Khalil, I don't know if you had anything to add as well. Uh, you know, the beautiful part about being on a panel like this is you can just say ditto and then be quiet. Um, you know, so many incredible insights. And I know, you know, as I'm looking through the chat, I'm seeing people say, hey, John, can you tell us about that model again? Because we want to really understand how we can take this and do something with it. Um, and I think the essence of a lot of what we're describing is, you know, don't make this just a day and, and do your homework leading up to it. Um, and so if we marry those two ideas, it is constantly continue to educate yourself 
yourself and to understand. And John, to your point around like, how does that become just an organizational muscle? Because so many folks have had their, you know, moment in the spotlight that we don't want, right? We don't want to, to kind of have to be on the front page of the, the newspaper before something comes up or a moment in time or a moment on the calendar before we start to pay attention. What we're asking for is actually educate yourself the entire year, right? Ask right. these questions, get prepared for Juneteenth in January, not at the beginning of June, right? And so, you know, Janet, to your point, it, it's when you're scrambling to make those things happen that you find, well, we don't have time to check in with our, you know, African-American ERG, or we don't have time to kind of do our due diligence. And so let's just throw something together and get it out there. Um, and I think that that rush to react, as opposed to truly making it an institutional muscle, um, is why we do the wrong thing sometimes. And so, you know, if we can just kind of, you know, for everybody, listen in to the thing that these experts have said around, you know, don't make it a moment in time, do your due diligence, understand there's lots of uh, information and education out there and we just need to be willing and open to it. Great. All right. So I'm going to move us on to our next question for the panel. Um, what are you seeing now specifically in the country and in the world that makes Juneteenth especially relevant today? Um, again, yes, Congress just passed the bill. We're waiting for it to get signed. I don't know if it's officially been done. I got to Google in the background. Um, but <laughs> on the other hand, we're also still fighting state legislators that are arguing whether or not to teach race and frankly, American history in schools. So I really kind of want to get your thoughts on this. Um, I'm going to go to Janet first specifically. I, I want to know kind of your thoughts on, on where this is. Well, I mean, the truth of the matter is pretty much all of us pretty much all of us are thrilled to see that Juneteenth is gonna be made a holiday. Um, and part of, for me personally, part of what makes it so wonderful is that it can actually be taught, that people can know about it. And I believe if you start teaching one part of history, like John was saying, it puts it in context of American history, but history is a series of breadcrumbs and connections. So if you can teach this part of history, it then teaches another part. And so eventually you may be sitting in classes and we may hear about things. We may open the door to teach things like the burning of Black Tulsa. We may talk about the Wilmington race riots, how that was the first political insurrection. Um, we can talk about the fact that there's a Black city, Oscarville, buried under Lake Lanier here in Georgia where I am. We can find out about these things, but that should be what happens, right? But to your point, it's ironic, or some who are more cynical might say intentional, depending, you know, depending how you look at it, that here we are celebrating a holiday, making it a national holiday, at the same time that we have six states in the process of trying to stop the teaching of systemic racism in the schools or and, and black history or, or any kind of history that has that would have these kinds of things in it. You've got 14 states that are enacting um, restricting voting access. You've got police brutality still there. I mean, and whether we, for whatever, even whether it's fair or not that Juneteenth as a holiday became a holiday after the death of George Floyd, it is linked to that. And that, that's when people started paying attention to it, but it's ironic that that's what happened. I mean, that, that's what it took for the holiday to become a holiday. Um, I personally want to see Juneteenth celebrated but contextualized. It should be a celebration, but we ought to understand what it means in the bigger picture. And we should understand it as a doorway to education and insight that we didn't have before. That's what I wanna see. And I wanna see it understood so that everything around it is understood. I want it to be understood because I'm hoping that we can understand the, the danger of justice denied. I wanna see it understood so it can't be repeated again. Juneteenth is really more relevant now in this moment than it would have been at possibly any other time in the past few decades. But it's also relevant because it shows us, well, it shows us how far we've come. It should stand as a beacon for how far we can go. But what it's going to take is not letting Juneteenth be, Juneteenth be, as Khalil said, a moment, but part of a bigger understanding and insight into what history has been and what it, we don't ever want to go back to again. And, and something that just came up too um, that I'm seeing, how do you feel about members of Congress agreeing to the Juneteenth holiday as a symbolic gesture? And, you know, and how do we make it more than just <laughs> as I see Janet's quick little eye roll there. <laughs> Sorry, um, let me roll the eyes. 
hey, it's, it's your honest opinion. So, I, you know, what do we feel about, you know, kind of, and even then the changing of perceptions, right, of this, this feel that it's more performative than it's natural when again that we're we're not trying to push anything that isn't what's actually in our history what's happened in the United States of America so I don't well, know if anyone wants to touch on that but just, let me throw that you one point to what you're saying one thing that's interesting I saw that one of the people who was against in, in one, one of the politicians who was against the holiday a couple of them has said that what they don't like is they don't want it called Independence Day because it will confuse it with July the 4th and I kind of look at it and say, well, whether or not it's confused depends on who was free. I'm not confused. I know we weren't, my people weren't free on July 4th. So we know it was Independence Day, but we have a tendency because this is a sensitive issue. We have a tendency to get caught up and trip over ourselves with language in ways that it's not helpful. The bottom line, you could have two Independence Days because we had two, in, two Independence Days. And so what we call it, is irrelevant. And for you to say you don't want to have it or you don't want to see it became a holiday because you don't like what it's called, that to me is obstructionism. And that's the kind of stuff that we have to get past if we're ever going to make any progress on anything in this country. And, and Shana, just really quickly to, to Jana's point, I think part of why this is so relevant now to the question that you're asking to me is this awareness that equity and justice are not evenly distributed, right? So even when we you know, put out a new law, it is not evenly distributed to folks. Even when we decided that some people were free, it was not evenly distributed to folks. And there's value in being able to understand that, that you don't change culture with the kind of swipe of a pen, right? There's communication that goes into that, there's support that goes into that, there's behavior that goes into that. Um, and I I think that these are all really positive things for us to be able to talk about. Um, and that's why it's so relevant right now is that the world has almost never been smaller, right? We all have platforms and, you know, again, to Janet's point, like she posted something this morning and people are already reposting it, and commenting on it and, and, and being inspired by it. And that's a wonderful thing. And so, you know, it, it doesn't mean that when we look back on some of the, the scars of our past that we're looking back and saying everything was wrong and we're, you know, everything is horrible. What we're saying is is that we should understand it. What we're saying is that we should be able to contextualize it. What we're saying is that all of those people mattered um, and that history is filled with all of those people just the same way that our corporations are filled with all of those people. And so if we're only looking at our engagement scores and looking at the ones that are saying, yep, everything is awesome here. And we say, great, company is good. We can move forward. But we're not recognizing that we've left a bunch of people behind. Or to John's point about going back into offices and recognizing that not everybody is excited about that or not everybody has childcare or not everybody can, you know, do the things that some can do if we're only looking at that kind of top percent and saying, hey, they're good. So that means we're all good. Then I think that that is it's just an organizational miss. It is a cultural miss. Um, and it's something that we need to reckon with. And I think that, you know, this is not the single moment that's going to allow us to do all of that. But this is an example of that space where people are saying, well, whoa, 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 won't this be confusing? And we're saying, well, you know, what helps with confusion? Communication and education and discussion. So if you think it's going to be confusing, how much worse do you think it is when we're not talking about these things? Um, and so I just feel like there's an amazing opportunity. And that for me is why it's so relevant right now is that we are contending with different histories and different facts and different places to get our data. Um, and the more that we can start to come together and have some really shared and open and honest conversations about who we've been, who we are and who we want to be, I think that it, it, it inherently benefits all of us. Perfect. And I do want to transition to our last at least prepared question, which is because um, I know a, there's a lot of history between everyone on this panel, um, as it is a star studded panel, you know, in my personal unbiased opinion, that is incorrect. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to ask, um, how does your personal history as a black person in America guide your current life and work? And Khalil, I want to specifically toss this one to you first. Kind of tell us about your background and kind of where that leads you into your current space. Yeah, I mean, you know, specifically for me, um, as I, I 
thought a little bit about this. You know, the, I, I have been a manager of three people, 30 people, 300 people. Like I've had the fortune of doing a lot of things, but I've always been a black boy. I will always be a black male. Um, that is the thing that doesn't change no matter where I go and no matter what I do. And it has absolutely influenced the way that I engage in the world. Um, it's influenced kind of how I approach things. And I think that in a lot of ways, it has made me a more empathetic leader because I am more aware of the spaces that I'm in and the way that I operate and, and how I'm perceived and how I perceive others and how I create opportunities. Um, and so for me, you know, the, the kind of spaces that I've grown up in, the, the ways that I've been supported or not supported, the things that I've seen and done um, have always just been a part of the fabric of who I am. And so, you know, in my current work, and I, I go right back to what John was saying, which is, you know, as I'm thinking about inclusion, diversity, and engagement, I am thinking about that for the entire population. Um, I'm not looking at kind of raising one group over another or only focusing in a particular area. I'm seeing the gaps, I'm seeing the misses, I'm seeing the opportunities and saying, what are the things that we can do that actually lift up everyone, that create more of that equity, that create more of that fairness? Um, and used to work with an amazing leader who would always say, and, and I know many folks have heard it, a rising tide raises all boats. Um, and so this notion of how do we raise people up? How do I kind of see the experiences that certain groups and demographics and individuals are having, and then use those experiences to inform better practices and policies and systems and procedures to be able to lift the entire group up. Um, and that's just a natural part of kind of how I've grown up. And so um, there's no part of that that I would change. Um, and yet I recognize that when I'm, you know, on a webinar in a, you know, suit jacket communicating in one way, I may be seen in, a, in one way. Um, and when I get in my car and drive someplace or when I'm telling my eldest son, you know, when he goes out and he's driving around, um, those are some very relevant things for me. And I, I, I've had to navigate those spaces and I get to navigate those spaces. Um, and that's something that I'm uh, extremely fortunate. Thank you. Yo, thank and you John, I, I, and again, I was yeah. gonna toss you, John, because yeah. I know specifically you have an interesting background that I wanted to get to. Well, well thank you. And I, I, I just so resonated with so much of what Khalil has said. Uh, you know, like so many folks on this line, I'm the son of an immigrant uh, mother who came to this country looking for the American dream. And uh, you know, and she, when she arrived here, uh, you know, her job for years uh, was either sewing clothes or cleaning toilets. Um, and, and she saved up money so that our family could be brought over one by one. I have two older sisters. Uh, and, and so her whole purpose was that I would be the first male in our family history to, uh, to be able to go possibly to college, which uh, did come to fruition. Uh, so, uh, you know, my whole perspective is that uh, much like Khalil, all, you know, uh, some people are called to be systemic change agents, but everybody's called to be a personal change agent. Uh, and so at the end of the day, um, uh, whatever has happened in my life, how have I done, what have I done to sort of help be part of the solution and not part of the problem, right? How are we transferring pain into progress? Uh, and so we all have that sort of individual responsibility. Uh, and at a moment like this, uh, we are all here for such a time as this. It's now a ripe moment to participate in the conversation, to drive the dialogue towards potential solutions, uh, to increase understanding. I think for those of us who have been blessed with leadership roles, how are we bringing humility and empathy to the table um, and creating that psychologically safe environment for, for folks to literally grow? Um, for allies to emerge? How are we empowering all of that? So, you know, that's the, that's the personal takeaway, I think, for many of us is to sort of examine uh, how are we becoming part of the solution? And that's perfect. And I just, just want to note that there's a lot of calls for um, this panel to, to be the next, uh, next cabinet, president, vice president, <laughs> secretary of state. So just want to make sure that there's a political future for people on this panel. If anyone is interested in that, Secretary of Education, Dr. Lila Ammons, am I right? Because I haven't seen that one pop up in the chat yet. So, but um, I do want to, there's a lot of conversation happening and I do want to make sure that we get into our final section, which is what are we doing for the future, right? So we've had this conversation, we've talked about the past, we've mentioned our history and we've kind of discussed the present, we've anchored, especially with this panel, what we are, but where, where are we going, right? How do we continue this conversation? 
And there was a great point to be made about, especially for those who are not black, right? How do you acknowledge? How do you address? How do you kind of, you know, examine this moment? Do you celebrate? Are you here in the moment for Juneteenth? What is it that you do? And so one of the recommendations for our panel or what we want to do is just give you an opportunity to, you know, to learn, to spend that time. And so one of the things that we would like to share as a group is some recommendations on some further discussion learning. Um, I, I wanted to share as well, even though I am not one of the panel members, but uh, I wanted to highlight specifically a podcast that I enjoy called Code Switch that's produced by NPR. It's hosted by Jean Denby and Shereen Marisa Maraji. Um, and they have beautiful conversations on race, but I want to specifically highlight uh, an episode called Location, Location, Location that beautifully addresses how the legal practices of housing discrimination permeates through all aspects of Black life. So yes, we've talked about the history of Juneteenth, but you know, once slavery ended, it wasn't like, yay, Black people, everything's great, right? Um, you know, there's Jim Crow, there's segregation, and then it also ended up with, you know, housing discrimination. And so between generational wealth, schools and education, health, safety, and policing, all of that is dependent on where you live, right? So if you think about your house and where you live, that's a, a lot of that's tied to that. There's a great location specifically on, or great episode on location specifically about that. So I definitely recommend uh, checking out that podcast, but specifically that episode. And so now I'm going to stop talking and let our panel uh, recommend theirs. I'm going to toss to Dr. Ammons first. I know some of the, the stuff that you referenced was in this book that you're recommending to everyone here. Absolutely. I uh, would recommend anyone to pick up the book from John Hope Franklin and Evelyn Hickenbacham, the ninth edition particularly, because I should say to you that there, there are over 12 different editions of this, but particularly the ninth one from Slavery to Freedom, if you want an in-depth understanding of the African-American experience, not only in America, but throughout the global community, this is a great book. Thank you, That's thank you. Uh, John, what are you recommending to our audience today? Well, uh, given my addiction to food, I'm recommending High on the Hog. Uh, <laughs> and it, uh, it is about the remarkable influence of uh, Black and African, Black American and African foods uh, on the history of this country. But you are going to learn a bit more about resilience. Uh, you're going to learn a bit more even about contemporary issues that our population currently faces. And so no matter what your background or history, uh, you're going to discover some very fascinating insights from this program. I'm a foodie too, so yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Galil, I want to go to you. What is the recommendation you are giving to our audience today? I am recommending The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. Many folks may have read it, but just an incredibly insightful dig into understanding how mass incarceration, um, kind of over-policing, um, sentencing, all of those things have extremely negative implications on an entire population. Um, and so I I think, you know, many folks can sometimes go to a place of individual responsibility. And if you just don't do bad things, well, then everything will be fine. Um, and yet when you start to really uncover and understand some of the institutionalized um, over-policing, it is incredibly powerful. So loved it. And it's a, an incredibly kind of fluid read. Perfect. And last but not least, Janet. Well, I'm going to recommend How the Word is Passed by Clint Smith. And I'm going to, you know, admit to some similarity bias. Clint Smith is a Davidson College graduate and I'm a Davidson <laughs> College graduate. I think there's some, poor, some other wildcats on this um, call right now. And uh, but Clint's a poet, he's done several pieces, but this book, which just came out, um, talks about monuments and landmarks. And what he's talking about is literally how the word is passed, how the story of slavery and black America is told, some of it true, some of it not. And there is a chapter in there about Juneteenth, but he also talks about some of these plantation recre recreations and recreations and how this is how the narrative is written through these monuments and these different landmarks. And like I said, some of it is true and some of it is not, but it's a fascinating read to just watch it. He starts in New Orleans and goes across the country and it, it is a fascinating read. I recommend it highly. Right. And just so you know, our recommendations are just a small taste of the recommendations that we have 
Um, I would love to share and announce a few more with you that there is a much larger list of resources that the NLI has compiled and posted on our brand new webpage, neuroleadership.com slash Juneteenth. Um, you will find this resource list that is downloadable so you can use it, share it with people that you know, share the web page with people that you know. This episode today will live on that page as well. Um, by all means, please don't think that our resources and what our panel recommends is a comprehensive list. You won't make it to the list and magically know everything there is to know about Black, Black Americans, race, and how to have discussions on the topic. You can't just check off the box and be like, done. <laughs> um, it's meant to be a stepping stone and a guide for you, especially if you don't know where to start. But we hope that this is kind of a way for you to kind of answer those questions on your own and kind of begin that conversation if you don't know how to. Um, but I wanted to start and wrap up with this. I, you know, we have a few minutes left. I want to, if anyone has any parting words, Dr. Ammons, I know you've you may have some some key things that you want to take away with some people. So I, I may want to toss it over to you to kind of give a quick, quick little wrap up if you want to leave some parting words with our audience. It's just just a couple, just a couple. Uh, one is that knowing your history will keep you from dooming to repeat it. I'm sure that's old saying everybody's heard. We prosper more together. Uh, when we use different perspective and help to optimize results. And the last thing is the power of resilience and persistence will never leave you wrong. Those are my last ones. Those are my three uh, things that I think that you uh, certainly should take away from, from this conversation. And there are things that you can live by, uh, not only, um, not just for African-Americans, but for humans, period. You got to know your history to make sure you don't repeat it. Those are my things. You can say that again. <laughs> John, uh, what about you? Yeah, uh, just as a follow on and to further validate the, the terrific words we just heard, uh, I would love for us all, no matter our background, no matter the color of our skin, to return back to a time of storytelling. Uh, we've mm -hmm. all had experiences. Uh, nothing drives understanding in the human brain better than storytelling. And so I would love for us to continue to gather around the table as we've been forced to in 2020 as a result of the pandemic and tell some stories. Uh, you know, that will drive the understanding of the next generation and the generation after them. We are a people of storytelling, but I think we've lost that. And so by talking about uh, the stories of our lives and, and, uh, and, and of those who've come before us and the sacrifices they've made, it helps to drive this hope and sense of resiliency that enables us uh, to deal with whatever's going to be coming our way tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, anyone else from our panel? Khalil, Janet, want to open it up to you? I'll go and then I'll let Khalil take us out of here. I will speak directly to, um, you know, sort of the businesses that are trying to do this. Basically understand that history's value is context for the present, but it's a caveat for the future. So never shy away if you're a business or you have a leadership role for using business, because I do believe that business is where a lot of this can change. Don't use the business and use it wisely with intention. Take the history, commemorate it, bring it there, give it context. Understanding and acknowledging is both a responsibility and an opportunity. Be transformative, not performative. Perfect. And Khalil? Yeah, absolutely. I, so just two quick things. And one that I mentioned before, and I think we all have, is don't let the calendar be the only thing that drives our acknowledgement or our awareness, right? John spoke about the seeds model and distance bias is, is super clear. If the only time you tell your partner you love them is on Valentine's Day, you're missing <laughs> something. If the only time you tell your children you care for them is on their birthday, you're missing something. If the only time you're having conversations about Black history is Juneteenth or Black History Month, you're missing something. So it can be a good reminder but if it's the only thing that's driving, then there's a miss there. Um, and then the second I think is, you know, I, I encourage folks not to only focus on the beliefs, pay attention to the behaviors as well. And I think that's the thing that we're seeing from so many folks in their reaction is, you know, yes, this is wonderful. And what about those voting rights that Janet spoke about? And what about the, you know, the brutality that we've been discussing? And what about some of these other things where we're really asking for systemic changes and we're asking for more representation and we're asking for more senior leaders at the table. And so having the day off is incredible if we do something with it, um, if not, and it just becomes another day that I don't have to work, then it's in a lot of ways a failure. 
Agreed. Well, thank you so much to our panel, Dr. Ammons, John, Khalil, Janet, could not have done this without you. Thank you to everyone who was super engaged as well in the chat. Um, 